Hi. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And uh, I just want to start off by saying I, I work on two projects with two different SK precursors, and I'm just really been really grateful for being able to work for the, with them in uh, the last few years. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about timing pulsars uh, with Meerkat. So uh, I just want to start off with uh, the joy of pulsar timing. So we've heard a lot today about people making wonderful images with interferometers. I'm going to look at one single pixel in that image and tell you why it's the best pixel. So uh, here's an example of plots of residual arrival times from the first millisecond pulsar taken from 1984 until the end of 2022. And uh, we know that for pulsar timing is a phase coherent process, which means that we're sensitive to processes that only very ma uh, manifest themselves as very small Doppler shifts. So millisecond pulsars, as Deborah mentioned, are the most sensitive, and, uh, but pulsars also exhibit timing noise. So this pulsar here is showing evidence of timing noise. This is a red noise process that we see. Uh, but that, that being said, I know from the first observation to the last, there is exactly 585,999,381,787 rotations of the pulsar. So I'm looking forward to a, billion, a trillion rotations of this pulsar sometime in the future. But, and we'll be able to time this pulsar like this as long as we have radio telescopes. Uh, if you were to equate this to a gravitational wave strain, the gravitational wave signal would also, also look like this. Uh, if you looked at this delta t here divided by the, t the total time span here, that's you know, around a millisecond over a billion seconds is 10 to the minus 12 in strain units. The signal we're looking for is on the order of 10 to the minus 15. So we need pulsars to be able to reduce uh, pulsars that are more stable than this to do our experiments. So uh, Deborah alluded, you know, discussed this in, in detail, but uh, what we're really interested in seeing is binary supermassive black holes staring to the centers of galaxies, you know, places that are very difficult to study otherwise. And uh, the most likely signal we're go is going to see, or the first signal we expect to see is a stochastic background. That's the gravitational waves from all the supermassive black holes in the visible universe. So uh, what we expect to see is this stochastic background, which is a red power spectrum. So it's going to have similar shapes to that timing noise that we saw in the previous pulsar. It's characterized by an amplitude and a spectral index. Uh, it's manifested in two ways. We call it, uh, it's, it's, in, you know, it's referred to as common, no, uh, common red noise, but I like to think of it as background noise in the sense that all the pulsars are going to be experiencing this uh, push and pull as the gravitational waves pass between uh, the pulsar and us that's going to cause the arrival times to vary. And it's just going to cause that, those, that, that, that noise to be present in all the pulsars at the same uh, level. Uh, because of timing noise, intrinsic rotational instabilities, that's not sufficient to claim the detection of gravitational waves. So you need to see these Hellings and Downs correlations. That's the quadrupolar nature of the gravitational waves. So what we're seeing here now is in this, uh, the gravitational waves passing by the Earth, which are the correlated part, uh, the, the ones passing by the pulsar, which are uncorrelated, and the combination of the two. And if you were to look here, I've got a simulated array where I've got pulsars in a ring. And you can see here how the uh, the pulsar bit becomes uh, correlated and anti-correlated and then returns to correlation again. And that's the quadrupolar nature of the gravitational waves that, was, that we're looking for. As uh, you know, Deborah mentioned, all uh, pulsar timing rays have seen evidence for this background noise. And indeed, the IPTA itself has seen background noise in a deprecated data release. That, that is data that's uh, less uh, modern than the ones that the individual PTAs have seen. As I mentioned, other, other sources of noise can mimic background noise and, and potentially cause a false detection of a gravitational wave. And uh, no, there's no evidence yet for or against Hellings and Downs correlations. So I, I, in response to this, I want something that Ziggy asked uh, about the sensitivity of, 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 of timing rays. Uh, there is two distinct regimes in the way that uh, uh, signal to noise increases with time. And there's the weak signal to noise regime when the signal is dominated by me measurement in the cross correlations and strong signal when it's uh, uh, dominated by the self noise. And that's where you get the t to the power of a half uh, that Deborah had mentioned earlier. Uh, the key point here is that in either of these regimes, you benefit uh, most by timing the largest number of pulsars. Uh, the, the, the signal really s scales with the number of pulsar pairs that you're observing. So it's similar in, in, to an interferometer in that way. So how are we going to time a large number of pulsars? We're going to time pulsars with Meerkat. So it's got a, it's a really efficient, uh, high sensitivity system. 
It's got a wide band observing system. All the timing that I'm going to present today is using the single L band receiving system that's got a two to one observing bandwidth. It's also got a very fast uh, slew speed, so we can hop between sources very quickly. Uh, this work is part of the MirTime large survey project, which is pulsar timing in four themes. There's a globular cluster timing, thousand pulsar array, time, uh, slow pulsar timing, the PTA project that I'm going to talk about, and relativistic binaries, and Ingrid's in the audience, and uh, his leads that project. This is just a plot showing you a comparison of, of, of the sensitivity of Meerkat to the uh, uh, you know, major, major northern hemisphere telescopes, uh, single dish telescopes, and you're, you're, you're seeing this uh, you know, improvement, and this is game changing. So uh, in terms of where the PTA is at, the first thing that we did was figure out what pulsars are suitable for timing. You know, we're timing pulsars at, at a SKA site, uh, so we're, we're, we can go and say, what timing precision can we achieve with an SKA precursor on an SKA site? And that's gonna tell us both about how to time pulsars with Meerkat, but also with, with the SKA. We talked, uh, Whale mentioned about jitter noise, and that's the self noise caused by the individual pulses from pulsars not being perfect, not being the same. Uh, so we, we, we had a first look at that and, and had the assessment about what pulsars are being affected by that to what extent. And uh, on top of that, we can use the uh, Meerkat's sensitivity to do very detailed studies of the interstellar medium. So what I'm showing you here now is what's called the secondary spectrum, and this is related to the uh, uh, interstellar scintillation of this very bright millisecond pulsar. And I don't have not, don't, can't, can't really go into my, much detail here, but towards this pulsar, which is a very nearby pulsar, we can see 20 different scattering screens towards it, including two scattering screens from the bow shock itself. So what I really wanted to talk today about was uh, the, the timing array and the long-term timing. So the motivation here, again, was to time the largest sample of pulsars to the high, to at least some microsecond precision. And uh, we, we, took the, we took the observations from the MSP census, and what we said is that if we could achieve uh, one microsecond timing precision in less than 256 seconds, that's you know, approximately four minutes, we'd observe for that. And uh, if uh, the pulsars uh, couldn't be, achieve that in 20 minutes, we, didn't, we, we thought it wasn't worth the uh, effort. And so compare this four minute observation time to what's, what's, what people do it with uh, GBT, which is typically 20 minutes, and with Parks, which is 64 minutes. This allows us to do a very uh, efficient pulsar timing program. And as of uh, sort of, you know, now we have 80, 88 pulsars that are in this, and we have, we're really focusing on pulsars in the southern hemisphere because there's great, uh, t uh, you know, lo lots of metal in the northern hemisphere. So if I was to take that scaling relation from Siemens at all and, and see what we, we could get, uh, this, this, is, this, is what, this is what we see. We see that the meerkat sensitivity, you know, increases very, great, increases very uh, significantly with time. And that's due to the number of pulsars that we're observing. And uh, we, we can do this uh, observing program just in context is, you know, 12, it's 12 hours of integration time, which works uh, per, per, per epoch, which is like around 320 hours per year. And this is, you know, a, a very efficient program and, you know, comparable, you know, and, and, you know, modestly less than sort of what the Nanograv GBT program is. So, uh, we had our first timing data release uh, earlier this year. So we did a, uh, produced a two and a half year data set that's now publicly available, it includes 78 pulsars. This includes calibrated profiles, arrival times, and the templates that were used to do the timing. And there's a question about the Meerkat clock. So one of the things that we did when we were doing this was compare, uh, see if we could recover the Meerkat clock signal. That is the difference between the Meerkat maser and GPS time. And, th and this, is, this, is, this is what we found. Oh. We, we, f we found here that uh, through, through most of the observing that we could, we, could, we could keep track of time to within 50 nanoseconds without requiring the clock itself. There's an interesting period here where there's a, there is a discrepancy between what the MSPs think time is and uh, the Meerkat clock correction, Meerkat clock thinks time is, or KTT thinks it is. And you can see here that this is an epoch where there is lots of uh, variation, lots of tweaks were made with, to the Meerkat maser. So that's work in progress. But the point, and we also demonstrated here that we are achieving our sub-microsecond precision. So uh, we've now extended that data set. So uh, we've got data that goes from February uh, 2019 to January of, uh, of this year. Uh, we used the data, a data reduction approach using the same method that we used previously. Uh, we searched for astrophysical noise processes 
Uh, this includes dispersion measure noise that Deborah mentioned, but also scatter broadening noise as well. This is to do with turbulence in your solar medium, as well as to uh, st study the solar wind and uh, the jitter noise that, we, that was mentioned in the questions. And really, we want to motivate having the best models for these uh, noise processes when we're doing gravitational wave searches. Uh, when we look, do our, have our best models, this is for, for one of the best pulsars here, and we are seeing achromatic noise. And this, this noise, it could be the uh, background noise, it could be gravitational waves, but uh, we, we don't know yet. However, we also have to, uh, we, we're also timing a lot of highly dispersed pulsars. So one of the things that we're concerned about in pulsar timing arrays is the fact that the ISM can cause uh, not just dispersion variations, but higher order propagation effects that might make timing distant pulsars difficult. So uh, here's an example of, what, of, of a schematic of, of what we might think might be happening, where if you had a pulsar and a, a scattering screen with the interstellar medium, it's possible that the low frequency emission, which is shown here as orange, travels along different paths than the high frequency emission, which is shown in black. That is going to, could result in propagation effects that might corrupt the arrival times and make the pulsar not sensitive to gravitational waves. Uh, for this pulsar here, which is a very dispersed pulsar, what we found is that if you, do, if you use a standard modeling technique, you would con conclude that there was achromatic red noise and dispersion measure noise. And uh, that, that's, what, that's what's shown here. So what's shown here is the timing where you haven't done any modeling modeling where you've uh, included red noise and dispersion measure noise, and this is, this is the red noise that's left over. And what you see here is that that's a big, loud red noise signal. And that you know, would be, make you less, much less sensitive to the gravitational waves. However, when you include the scattering noise in the model, this is what you get. Things are looking pretty good. So the uh, implication here is that, first, first of all, you need a good model. But it's also that we can also time highly dispersed pulsars as part of uh, a pulsar timing array. So this means that you have more pulsars because you can, you can observe pulsars more, more distant in the, in the galaxy. It also means that you might be able to time pulsars at lower frequencies as well. So timing pulsars with SK low, or you know, even with Meerkat with the UHF band, which we don't do yet, might be possible, and pulsars are brighter at lower frequencies. So this might also increase your sensitivity to gravitational waves. So uh, we've also done preliminary searches for this background noise. And what we do is uh, we use the same approaches that have been used by the other, other timing arrays. And what we find is the amplitude of this noise is sort of consistent with the other experiments. Uh, so uh, despite having a shorter timing, timing span, you know, we're able to detect this signal that other PTAs are seeing. Uh, the, uh, work ha this is work in progress. You know, we won't want to do things like take our array and divide it into two and make sure that we're seeing the same signal in both halves. But uh, that will, uh, but that, the beauty of having a large uh, sample of pulsars is you can do cross validation experiments like that. So, uh, of course, this is not, you know, this is only detection of, 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 a, of, a, of common noise. So what we really need to do is confirm the presence of, a, of, a, of this signal by searching for Hellings and Downs correlations. And we'll do that in collaboration with the IPTA. Uh, basically, the, the signal itself, if you divide it into different frequency bins, it's got this shape that you might expect for a gravitational wave background as well. Uh, we should really consider, I guess, with because of the finite uh, duration of the Meerkat experiment, there wasn't, uh, we weren't really in the position to do a lot of exploration in terms of optimization that way. But uh, yeah, I take that point. I'm aware of, of interference from GSM stations around the Meerkat site, yeah. maybe not so bad in the core, yeah. and around 900 megahertz, and which sounds like quite prime territory in the frequency range for you know compromising between yeah. scattering and, and the pulsar spectrum. I'm just wondering how much effect you've had from that in, in yeah. your timing data so far. Uh, so for the millisecond pulsars, because they uh, because, of, because they're spinning so rapid, rap, rotating so rapidly, a lot of the interference problems are, are subdominant. So uh, we, we see issues with uh, impulsive interference from uh, uh, in, in when we when we observe the slow pulsars, but the, the millisecond pulsars are, are it seems to be like not uh, a reduced 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 effect. I mean, narrowband signals, of course, you can kind of just uh, excise. I forget how 
how broad the GSM bands are. But uh, yeah, that's uh, where, yeah, that, that, that was one of the pleasant surprises, I guess, for, the, for well, we know, we know the site should be radio quiet, but it was uh, how, how easy, you know, how relatively uh, straightforward it was to get, get data to students to go and analyze without having to, you know, do a lot of uh, significant RFI excision was one of the, was, was one of the uh, surprises when we started doing the MSP timing. So could you say that in the era of the SKA that we wouldn't really be worried about this problem or is that well, under, I, I under mean, or overstatement? I'd have to think a bit more about it. I mean, the one thing is that you need to keep all your systems linear as well. So if you start getting interferers that are causing receivers to go nonlinear or you know, digitizers to do interesting things, that's, that, that, that complicates things greatly. Right, okay, thanks. I feel like uh, you threw in uh, a little bait, so I'll take it on the 11 screen, uh, yeah. the 11 yeah. screens in that puzzle. Yeah. That's crazy. So uh, can you say a little bit more about it? Are, are, are a couple of them dominant? What does it mean for FRBs? Are we really like oversimplifying it greatly? Yeah, I think it's, it's quite interesting. So we have, this is the, uh, it's the most, one of the, it's the most nearby millisecond pulsar. And it's a really bright, bright pulsar. So I think that what it means is that there's, I, I would argue that there's probably some intermittency in the plasma in the sense that if you're relatively nearby, maybe there's a few that are, you know, there's, there's no like one dominant scattering screen. I think if, when you go to more, more distant pulsars, there's probably screens that become more, you know, dominate so much over the rest that, it's, that, you, that you see it. Okay, yeah, I mean, one last quick question. <laughs> Hello? Yes, this is you. Um, this will be really quick. Uh, how does your timing array compare to something like FAST, which is much bigger than GPT? That's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we're not, uh, I think uh, there are, there, there's a lot of promising coming out, coming out FAST as well. I'm not quite sure. Uh, how many pulsars they're timing. The one nice thing about a telescope like Meerkat with, with small antennas is that you can uh, slew around really quickly. So it's really easy to kind of go from source to source. So there's, uh, there's you know, we, observing is like, uh, the overhead is like 15% when, when you're doing pulsar timing. So it's, it's, uh, it's good that way versus uh, those of us who grew up with like, air, you know, teles telescopes like Arecibo timing and fast would be similar. Or we recognize that there's lots of, you know, move, moving big things around is, uh, takes a long time. Okay, let's conclude the first half.